Today, we meet advanced freelancer Laura Briggs, who will talk to you about the differences between freelancing and having a job. I met Laura virtually through Vertforce, but we met for the first time in person at the Military Creator Conference. In fact, this episode is a part of a mini series to introduce you to the people behind the resources at Military Creator Con. Welcome to the Burt Force Podcast. Our show helps active duty military spouses plan virtual careers. Each week, we'll be uncovering the secrets of virtual work to help get you hashtag hired. If you want income sustainable from anywhere in the world, this is the show for you. We are bringing you everything from juicy job opportunities to advice on how to glow up for a virtual interview. And now let's meet our host. She's the change maker responsible for getting over 700 military spouses hashtag hired and making a $15 million impact in the military community. Burt Force founder, professional speaker, remote staff augmentation specialist, visionary. Here's our host, Kimber Hill. She's been tap dancing for more than 30 years and still goes every week to tap dance with some really great girlfriends. She is an accidental 100K freelancer. She's published two books and her third is due in only seven months. It's Miss Laura Briggs. Laura, thank you so much for being on the Vert Force podcast. I'm excited to be here. I'm a fan of Vert Force and everything you all are doing. So I feel like it's my honor to be here. It's our honor to have you. I mean, seriously, Laura, you are, I think I said this at PodFest and at Military Creator Con, you are an institution <laughs> in and of yourself. Everything that you do, you have a business, you have a job, you're creating a nonprofit, you're an author, you're ABD, PhD. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, you're, you're everything. You're what I want to be when I grow up. Oh, that's really. so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about your background and how you accidentally became a 100K freelancer. Well, as most of us military spouses do, I had a career before I met my husband. And then I realized after meeting him that it was not it didn't match with the fact that he would have to move and that his career would have to take priority. So I was a seventh grade teacher. I was also um, completing my PhD with Virginia Tech at night. So I taught all day in a middle school and then would go to my PhD classes at night and kind of realized, you know, we'd already moved twice by the point that I was doing that. And my husband was like, we're going to PCS soon. Like you have oh, wow. like a year left. Like, so I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, oh, you better hurry. <laughs> yeah. Like what I can't be a tenure track professor at a university when we potentially have to move every two to three years. Which that was your original plan, right? The tenure track. Yeah. I wanted to be like a public policy or political science professor. And I'd had experience in doing that, getting my master's and working on my PhD with Virginia Tech. Um, but I, I kind of realized that I didn't love that career path as much as I thought I would. And the fact that I needed to kind of adapt to what the Navy would want my husband to do gave me a good opportunity to explore something on the side. So I launched my freelance writing business as a side hustle. It was just an extra way for me to make money and like build up some of those cash reserves for whenever we had to move next. Cause I didn't know if I'd be able to find a job right away when we moved the next time. And it really grew leaps and bounds to the point where I realized I could do this full time. And then no matter where we live, as long as I have an internet connection, I can still do it. And that's like the ultimate thing for military spouses to have a portable, flexible career of any type that can just go with them. Yeah, absolutely. And you found a strength in writing. You knew that you were great at that and you knew that you could very easily provide that service to other people. Yeah. And I think a lot of people overthink it and they're like, oh, well, I'm, I have to have gone to journalism school or have a master's in English. I didn't mm -hmm. have any of that. I had one college professor who told me he liked my writing. And I thought, based on that comment, I thought, I bet I can build and learn some other stuff in the writing world to sell it in online marketing. Um, but I didn't have like a super formal education background in terms of being trained as a writer. So I always say that to people because 
you don't have to like psych yourself out of trying because you think you don't have those things. All right, listeners, let's take a break so I can deliver a message to you. This message is from Bloomer CPAs. Here's what they have to say. Bloomer CPAs is excited to sponsor the VertForce community. As a virtual firm, we find it so important to find the talent we need. We provide financial services, tax, accounting, and growth consulting to creative digital agencies all over the U.S. If you think you might be a great self-starter with experience in the world of serving clients in a public accounting firm, reach out to us at info at bloomercpas.com. And I think that goes back to a lot of different positions. You know, if you're applying for a remote job or you're thinking about offering your services, if you feel confident enough that you'll be able to perform well in the activity, unless there's this big red stamp on the front of it that says you have to have this license or this credential, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think we live in a time too, where we have tools like podcasts, like you can listen to things like this, you can take courses on Udemy, you can watch videos on YouTube. There's a lot of things you can teach yourself that you don't need a college degree for. So if you're interested in something, you know, find the cheaper, affordable option to go learn that and then build that into your business or into your remote work profile too. Absolutely. And listeners, that's called just in time education. Mm -hmm. Just-in-time education has, I would say, taken the past five years by storm. On the internet, all of these courses you see popping up, learn to do transcription in 10 minutes or 101 for video editors. That is just-in-time education that's here to teach you a skill immediately and let you move forward with it. Yeah. And don't feel like that's a bad thing either. I think some people are like, well, will an employer or will a client look down on me if I'm self-taught? I think the opposite is true. I think people see that as drive and motivation and they go like, Mm -hmm. oh, this person went and taught themselves something without anyone telling them to do it. They've built on a strength and they taught themselves. You can really use that to show that you're a very passionate driven person. And I think people like that. So we were talking earlier about... Before, before we started recording about the difference between remote work and freelancing. And for me, I see them as very similar, but you provided a really great definition to um, how to visualize them and interpret them and see how they play out in your life. Do you want to give us a little bit more insight on your opinion of how they're different? Yeah. So a lot of freelancers do work remotely and that's why people get confused and kind of like blend them necessarily together. The core difference is that when you're working remotely for somebody else and it's a job, so you're getting a W-2 or you're working part-time or full-time, that employer has taken on the risk of launching the business. They've already built the infrastructure and you're coming in as a piece of that. Freelancers are starting their own business. And so you're taking on that risk of all of the marketing efforts and the money and the energy that goes into building a business, you have to go out and get the clients. Whereas if you're working with an employer, that might not necessarily be a part of it. Um, So sometimes they can be super related because freelancers work remotely and you might use some of the same skills in a remote job that you would as a freelancer. But there is that important distinction. And I think you can do either one or you can do both together based on what's going to work best for you. Right. And you might hear freelancers also referred to as contractors. And in a lot of remote work, you will be contracted on a 1099 basis. And you may only contract for that one person. And it may be very much treated like you're a part of the team. But what Laura is really talking about here is establishing yourself Mm -hmm. as someone who can operate with multiple clients. Laura, how many clients do you think you have or had when you were at that 100K role? Um, I would say I never work with like more than eight to 10 clients at a time, which is still a lot for uh, most freelancers. I've been doing this now for eight years. And so Mm -hmm. I've taken my 
freelance business from a side hustle to a full-time gig and then back down to a side hustle again. And so it really depends on the type of clients that you have. So I have a lot of systems and processes built out. And I also have subcontractors that I use. I use virtual assistants and I use a public relations assistant to help me do some of the things in my own business. Um, so I would say like eight to 10 would be pretty standard and they, they would be contracts of different sizes. So I usually only ever work with a handful of bigger clients at a time. Right. So to be clear, you can have a 1099 W9 relationship with just one person. Yes. And just be working with that organization, which is very popular in remote work. Mm -hmm. Or you can be W2 with that organization. Or you can do what Laura has done and kind of create a brand for yourself, take on multiple clients, Mm -hmm. even hire your own subcontractors to help you outsource and execute and just kind of have this little enterprise that is you, which yeah. I think is amazing. And and I think one of the other like key differences between 1099 and W2 is like when you're 1099, you're paying the taxes on what you're yes. earning. Mm-hmm. And in a W2, your employer is taking care of that. So when you set your rates as a contractor, or when you think about, should I take this position as a contractor and the rate is set, like think about that. Like, are you still making sure that you're getting paid well, based on the fact that you have to cover your taxes out of that. Yeah. And let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of military spouses, uh, veterans and transitioning service members, when they hear that, if they haven't been introduced to that concept before, they may be a little standoffish from it. If you've been educated about it and you've been around it before, you understand that it's not that scary. Yeah. But if you haven't, you can think, oh, no, there's no way I want to put my toe in that water but it's really not that bad. Yeah. And and I think what's unique is when you work as a freelancer and you're marketing your services, rather than a company telling you what they're going to pay, you can determine what your rate is. So you can tell clients no, if you have multiple clients and they just don't have the right personality for you or the rate they want to pay is too low. And so you have that decision-making power to decide what that's going to look like for you. Um, Basically, what it means is as a business owner, at the end of the year, you have to take all the revenue you made and subtract all your expenses, which by the way, as a contractor, you have tons of expenses, the space of your home office, your internet, books, courses, coaching, consulting that you bought to help you grow the business, your website, hosting fees, all those things are tax deductible as expenses. Mm -hmm. And then whatever is left, depending on your business structure, you're going to have to pay taxes on that. Now you're supposed to pay them on a quarterly basis. You send in estimated taxes of what you think you're going to owe based on what you earn in that quarter. But if you have good accounting software and a good CPA to work with you, it's not that scary because they will often tell you everything you need to know. Every year, my CPA sends me two full pages of all the things I can deduct and asks me to go through and circle and then list the number so that they can run it. So a lot of tax professionals recognize that we do take a risk as business owners and they'll try to make sure you get every legitimate deduction that you can. What kind of accounting software do you recommend? There are some great tools out there. Zero is one that's very affordable. I also use GoDaddy Bookkeeping. It's only $10 a month and it's connected to my PayPal account, which is where I run most of my transactions through. And so it automatically captures everything that's going in and out of my business checking account that's going through PayPal. And then it will also show me like what my monthly income and expenses are. It will start to give me that estimate of telling me, hey, this is what your Q1 estimated taxes are looking like. And I find that to just be a great tool so that I don't have to enter everything manually. You can also use something more complex like QuickBooks, but I don't think you need to do that if you don't want to. Oh, that's amazing because I I was expecting you to just say QuickBooks Mm -hmm. because that's what everybody says. Yeah, (laughs) And I know that QuickBooks is a great tool, but one of the things that I love about you is you're always full of low cost ideas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) For example, we were chatting about project management tools and you introduced me to a couple of free ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not that you don't want to invest in something great, but sometimes if you're just getting started or you're bootstrapping and you don't have a lot of income or you don't have a lot of... um, capital to throw into something, the subscriptions can really start to add up. Yeah. And I firmly believe that you don't, don't invest in something until you have a need for it. So when you start like $10 a month for accounting software and $10 a month in website hosting, that might be a lot for you, but it's going to take a lot of work out of your plate too. And so I always look for 
bootstrap and low cost ideas until your business grows. Don't feel like you have to invest in those big name products that you've heard of because you can do a lot, especially as a solopreneur. If you're just an independent contractor and you have multiple clients, there's lots of budget friendly options. Thank you for sharing that. So why do you think that freelance work shows so much potential for military spouses? Well, we move all the time. So number one, something that can be portable is really, really important. And I think even when we try to look for traditional employment positions, sometimes the fact that we've moved so much um, gets counted against us. You know, even if someone doesn't necessarily say that, they're definitely possibly looking at your resume and going, hmm, they're, they're not making that connection as far as like, mm-hmm. well, we, we had to move for a partner or we had to move for someone in our family. And I think with freelancing, writing the entrepreneurial roller coaster, you adapt and evolve a lot as an entrepreneur. And a lot of military spouses have that skill already because they're used to doing it with their family (laughs) on the fly. They see a challenge in front of them and they develop a solution and overcome those obstacles. And so I think that works really well. And the fact that we can move and you can also scale freelancing up or down as much as you want. So maybe your spouse is deployed and you're now responsible for childcare at home and you have fewer hours to work. Like you can scale down the number of clients you work with or hire subcontractors to help you. But if you need it to be a full-time income, you can scale it up too. And it's very hard to find an employment situation that will be that flexible for you. So a lot of Mm -hmm. times it can just be a side hustle for you as freelancer. It can also be a full-time income if you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, if you're a military spouse and you're sitting in your car or at home and you're listening to this episode and you're trying to determine, okay, well, what's better for me? Should I go the remote work route and try to look for a one-to-one relationship or maybe just a couple of different opportunities here and there? Or should I try to develop some kind of service that I know I can provide and then begin to build clients? How do you decide? How do you know which is better for you? That's a great question. In an ideal world, you'd have both, right? So that you never have one thing that you're 100% reliant on for your Mm -hmm. income. But I will say, if you're the type of person who likes really clear structure and knowing what your hours are and what the expectations are, going the remote work route is for you because your client, well, not even your client, it's your employer, they'll tell you, hey, you need to be online between nine and five central. These are the expectations we have of you. These are your tasks. When you're doing something in the entrepreneur world, even if it's as an independent contractor, the onus is on you to do all of the planning. So you have to decide, where am I going to get clients from? How do I spend my time? What hours am I going to work? And some people are not comfortable with that much freedom. They would much just prefer to say, listen, I want to be able to close my laptop at 5 p.m. and I'm done. Or just do my 20 hours a week on my W-2 job and, and I'm out and I have my freedom after that. So if you're the type of person that really likes a set schedule... I would definitely go the remote work route if you want to be a part of a team like immediately. Because when you start your own business as an entrepreneur, you you won't have a team right away. You can't afford it. You just don't need it. So if you are like, I want to have colleagues, I want to have a team already built up that I can be a part of, remote work is a better fit. But if you're a person who wants to explore creative options and really build your own brand, freelancing is is a better fit. And you have a few books that you've published, well, two that you've published and one for sure that's in the works. Do you have any resources that could walk us through this or how can we learn more? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in writing, I have a book called How to Start Your Own Freelance Writing Business with Entrepreneur Press. And then I also have a PDF if you're like, I'm interested in freelancing, but I don't know what skills I have that I could use. And it's called the Top 24 Most Profitable Freelance Side Hustles. It tells you what freelancers charge. It tells you what those people do, um, what kinds of software they need to know. And it can really help you if you're brainstorming like, hmm, should I be a VA or should I be a proofreader or should I do something different altogether? Um, so that one is at betterbizacademy.com slash side hustle. And that's just designed to get you to start thinking about the different options available to you. Right. And I do want to hit on something you said a moment ago. Ideally, you would have both, mm-hmm. right? I I always love that term. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Mm-hmm. And the concept there is it's okay to have W-2 income and freelance income. Yeah. It's okay to have both and to create sort of a security net for yourself as long as you're very transparent with who you're working with about what you're working on and you're meeting deadlines and still showing up and giving 100% to where it's due. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just be upfront with people and decide what those different versions look like for you. If you Mm want to have a W-2 job, but you don't want to give up 40 hours a week, maybe you look for one that's only 20 hours a week and it's part time. But I like having multiple sources of income because if something unexpected happens that's outside of my control, I don't start from zero. I always have something else that I can just pivot or scale or start something else altogether. And so that's why I like... um, I also think that having freelance income helps you upskill so that you can push yourself for promotions at your job. Because you can be like, hey, I just finished, I just learned Facebook ads for one of my clients and we ran a successful campaign. And you can share that with your employer to Mm -hmm. show them what an asset you are to their business too. Right, exactly. And tell us a little bit about how that plays out in your life because you have revenue streams coming in from everywhere, Mm -hmm. right? This is a great model. Laura sets such a fantastic example for the independent, you know, the financially independent woman, you could do whatever you wanted at any point in time because you're secure because you've created these streams for yourself. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I really believe in having multiple income streams. As many of them should be passive as possible, but it takes a long time to scale up passive income. And so I look for any and every opportunity where I see the potential to make some money, especially if it's a, I don't have to do a lot of work. So we took all of my old lesson plans from teaching seventh grade and we listed them on Teachers Pay Teachers. And that I don't even touch that business and it makes between three and six hundred dollars a month with no effort on my part. So I'm continuously getting paid that way. So I, then I have books, I do online courses, I do coaching of other freelancers, I do some speaking events as well. And so think about all the different skill sets that you have. And one of the other things that I like to think about is the people in my world who can't afford or are not the right fit for one-on-one coaching, I want to make sure they have accessible resources too. So that's where I do my book or a more affordable course that's maybe only an hour. And so think about that too. Like, How can you have things at different price points so that you're not relying on only one type of product or one really expensive service? And always be learning. Always be learning new things that you can implement for yourself and you know, potentially for your freelance clients or for your employer too. Absolutely. So we had a conversation and went through your concept and your idea to create a nonprofit that would help military spouses learn to freelance. Yeah, I have been working with freelancers for a long time as a paid coach. And then I also work with a handful of military spouses every quarter for free just to help them break in. And we create all their marketing materials, their pitch, their work samples, their marketing plan during that time. And I realized that it was kind of growing bigger than what I could handle. I was going to work with you know, two spouses per quarter. And I did a round of applications in, it was maybe early November and like 29 people applied overnight. And I was like, Oh no, this means I have to tell 27 people. (laughs) And I was like, I like so many of them were so qualified. I tried to make a short list and I couldn't, I was like, well, this person's great. And so I started thinking about how can I make this more formal because it's bigger than what I can do by myself. And so I had conversations with you and a lot of people like, what does this look like? Does this make sense? I talked to a nonprofit consultant and everything. And so Um, Then I was connected with another amazing military spouse um, in the nonprofit space with a lot of experience there. And she was like, I'm totally on board to, to come on as the volunteer programming director, like, let's get this built out. And so um, it was really cool because I was invited to go speak at Upwork's headquarters in January. It's the biggest freelance job board site in the world. And I've used Upwork extensively to land Mm -hmm. freelance gigs. And so they asked me to come out there and speak. And at the very end of my speech on stage, I mentioned like my next chapter is this nonprofit. And it was so cool because I stepped off stage (laughs) and someone said, the CEO wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, we want to give you $20,000 to start this nonprofit. Oh my And I was like, okay, the timeline for this, just like I was going to take a whole year to build it out. And they're like, we want to do like 20... (laughs) for 2020. And so I was like, okay, now I have to like put this in warp speed. And so we're planning to accept um, our first applications for 20 veterans, uh, military spouses and caregivers. 
to learn how to freelance. Um, we're probably going to be like late spring, maybe early summer. We'll accept applications and it'll be a 12 week program. They'll get mentorship courses. Um, my board of directors includes multiple people in the military and military spouse space who have experience freelancing. And so they'll have mm-hmm. access to some really cool mentors and, and programming. And I'm just super excited because I'm sure you know, 25% of veterans leaving service want to start their own business and get stuck with how. And so we wanted to do something that worked with veterans and with spouses because spouse on underemployment right. and unemployment, right. such big issues. Thank you so much for sharing that. And congratulations. I didn't know, yeah. we haven't really talked about it since <laughs> November. So I didn't know that all of these things had developed for you. So it sounds like you're definitely in the groove of where you need to be. Yeah, I'm really excited. I, I We just found out about the 501c3 status today. And so it's it's very exciting to like bring this to fruition. Something that was an idea and now it's like actually forming into a thing. And what's been really cool is I have a commitment in building this that everyone we work with is a military spouse so that, or in the military affiliated community. So our graphic designer is a military spouse, you know, like everyone who's helping me yeah. build this out is pulling from that same community. Um, Cause that just supports the mission. It doesn't make sense not to do that. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. It does. And that's, that's where we are too for vert force. That's how we support our team. And that's, our commitment to building out a team as well. But I love it. And it's it's so great that you're doing that. I'm really happy for you. Yeah. Let's chat about mindset too, because there's a certain type of a frame of mind and a state of mind to be in when you're ready to build something from the ground up or take on or pivot again. Yeah. I mean, don't you get exhausted from pivoting, but... <laughs> The great news is if you can pivot into something like freelancing yeah. or remote work, you can say goodbye to pivoting forever, right? Yeah. And I mean, like you will still always make little pivots in your business, but once you've made one of those bigger ones, you feel confident that you can make some of the smaller changes and adaptations that you need to. I think one of the most important things to keep in the back of your mind with your mindset is that someone else has almost always gone the route you want to go before. And if they haven't, there are lots of resources in your space that you can leverage. So like when I was Mm -hmm. building this idea for the nonprofit, I asked as many people in the military community if they'd be willing to just talk to me about it and see if it made any sense whatsoever because I didn't have any nonprofit experience and I wanted to hear from other people. I wanted to get that pushback. So my biggest tip is recognize that someone else has already gone down this route. And if they haven't, brainstorm your idea with a few people you trust, talk it out and see if you still feel as excited about it. And if someone pushes back, do you still feel like I can make this work? Because it's going to really fall down to your passion for something to push through some of those obstacles that you face. Like being new at anything is hard. And so you have to be willing to be uncomfortable in those moments and figure out how you're going to navigate those challenges. I like that being willing to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, be be willing to take a risk, be willing to be wrong, be willing to learn and grow? Yeah. Entrepreneurship, especially, or even like the search for the perfect remote job. Oh my gosh, I can identify with that so much. It is not (laughs) a straight upward line. It is like up and down. It's like a stock market, you know, graph. And it's really hard when you're in the down parts to feel like, this is the path you're supposed to be on. I guarantee you that is what everyone in that position feels like. We all, it's the people who choose to keep going even after they've hit the valley and they're like, okay, on to the next mountain. Like I'm going to push on from this. Um, We all experience those problems and those down times because it is not a straight line. It, It can really feel messy and uncomfortable and you question yourself. And that's part of the process. So like, Keep thinking back to your why and why do you want to do this and the passion that you have for it. Um, It will help you during some of those difficult times. And you'll always come out on the other side better for it. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a part of the remote work mindset too. And and first of all, not everybody is the right fit for it, Mm -hmm. right? You may not be someone with a personality type who is ready to pursue this. Maybe not now. It may be something that you acquire over time because I've certainly changed since becoming a military spouse and uh, going through several PCSs and career transitions. So I'm definitely a different person than I was three, five years ago. Mm -hmm. But if you have the perseverance characteristic, if you're the kind of person who says, I'm just not going to let these small things stop me, 
then this is probably something you need to get involved in, right? This could be an opportunity for you to find exactly what you're looking for, find that that little key component of fulfillment. And I know that's what we all struggle with as military spouses, the constant PCSing, the constant pivoting, the constant career search, the highs, the lows. You begin to question your identity. You begin to question your purpose. Yeah. Am I more than just a spouse? Am I more than just a mom? Am I more than just the house cleaner for this family? <laughs> And I think you get to that point where you just want something for you, right? You just want yeah. something that you can do. And, and freelancing and remote work is just something you can take with you everywhere. Yeah, it, it is. And so I think one of the cool things about freelancing is if you have that perseverance trait and you view obstacles as opportunities and not challenges, oh, yeah. this can be something that helps bolster you too. Because maybe you are looking for a remote job and your search hasn't panned out yet, but you're freelancing in the meantime, and it can build up your confidence and working with clients can make you feel better about going into interviews and talking about your skills and all those kinds of things. Um, so it can help you have that creative outlet and build who you are. Cause you're right. Mm -hmm. As a spouse, it's often like, am I just an extension of this other person that I have <laughs> to su support their career so much? And it's nice to have something for yourself too, where you feel like I'm developing professionally, I'm learning new yeah. things and I'm exercising Absolutely. my skills. So important to me. And we're very like-minded in that concept. I love that you said you see obstacles as opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. That will help. I can you, identify. That will help you in your remote work search or your freelance business as well. You have to think of it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Laura, tell us where our listeners can find you. You can find me at betterbizacademy.com. And then I have a podcast called Advanced Freelancing, where you can learn more about how to scale a freelance business once you've started. Which I've been listening to. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I love it because it doesn't just apply to freelancers. I run Vertforce. I founded Vertforce and I use Laura's freelancing tips to help me stay on top of my game as a business owner. Yeah. Did you name your books too? Oh, I didn't. Um, so How to Start Your Own Freelance Writing Business is available now. And The Six Figure Freelancer is on current pre-order status. So um, I hope that those resources will be helpful for your audience. Great. And we'll get some links to be provided in the show notes. So Laura, thank you so much for your time. I hope that we can get together again soon. You're such a, a resource for the military spouse community and I just love you and I'm so glad that we did this. Oh, me too. Thanks for having me. All right, Burt Force, that is it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe, rate our podcast and leave us a review. We really love hearing from you. If you need to find the show notes, which include all of the resources we discussed in this episode, you can find those at furtforce.us. Guys, I'm serious when I say we want to hear from you. If you have an idea for an episode or a question, email us at support at vertforce.us. As a reminder, all content associated with the Vertforce podcast is the intellectual property of Vertforce LLC. All right. Catch you next week.